We're going to finish our study of primitive data types with an e-commerce purchase. Let's write a program to calculate the cost of a purchase for an online sale at Glamazon.com. They're going to sell three items, mascara at $8.99, lipstick at $3.99, and eyeshadow at $6.89. Taxes are 6.5% and they're applied before shipping, and shipping costs $8. So the first thing we need to do is to start Eclipse. You want to create a workspace for the class if you haven't already. Make sure that you know where it is. So you could put it in a home directory, you could put it on your desktop. It really doesn't matter where it is so much as that you can find it. So the first thing we want to do is to start Eclipse. When Eclipse starts, it'll have a default workspace. Make sure you know where the workspace is. So here's what Eclipse looks like when it starts. The next thing we want to do is to create a project. Make sure you give your project a meaningful name. To create a project, you go to the File menu and choose New Java Project. Now, project names aren't very fussy. So I'm going to call my project Glamazon.com. We wouldn't be able to use that as a class name because it has a period in it, and that's not legal in a class name. We now have our project over here. I'm highlighting it and choosing the source directory. The source directory is where the Java files get saved. The next thing we need to do is to create a class. All of the Java programs are in a class. Class names start with capital letters and have no spaces in punctuation. The body of the class is in curly braces. The problem statement from the PowerPoint is a great comment to start the class. So I'll grab that on my way in so that we have it. So I'm copying the problem statement. creating a new class. There are two different ways you can do this. One is to go to the File menu and choose New Class. The other way, and the way you'll probably use the most, is right here with the little green target with the yellow plus sign on it. I'm calling the class Glamazon. Notice the capital G because it's a class name. And notice I didn't put .com because you can't put a period in a class name. As far as the boxes to check, this is the correct superclass. We won't know what that means for a while, so don't worry about it. And we're going to want to have a main program created. It's OK to have Eclipse create your main programs for you, but remember that when you're doing tests, you're going to need to know what those things are. So you might want to write a few of them yourself. In fact, why don't I set a good example and write it this time. So, Eclipse will create a class. Now, I don't like the way it really creates it very well because it does curly braces a different way than I like to do them. I like to have my curly braces line up on the left. I find that keeps the code neater and prevents mistakes. Now, I'm going to put a comment in that has the data that we captured from the original PowerPoint. Comments start with a slash asterisk, and they end with an asterisk slash. We'll do more structured comments later on. For right now, I'm going to clean this one up a little bit to make sure that we can see exactly what it looks like. Kind of liked the way that little asterisk looked, so let's put those in on every line. It's extremely important to keep your code neat and well organized. So you'll notice when I'm writing code, I spend a lot of time fussing with little things. I know it looks silly, but it makes a big difference in how easy it is to work with code in the long run. So lining up those little asterisks makes it a little prettier, and now we have a good place to start our program. The next thing we need to do is create the main program. The main program is inside of the class. Remember the signature for it is public static void main, open parentheses, string square bracket, args, close parentheses. The body is also contained in curly braces, and we indent it to show the structure properly. 
So here I am inside the class. I indented public static void main string square brackets, whoops, one key off, args, and here are the curly braces. Now you'll notice that Eclipse has a tendency to go nuts while you're doing these things and puts up all sorts of little red boxes. Just ignore them. It's trying to compile your code before you finished writing it, which is one of Eclipse's bad habits. So don't worry about them until after the lines are done. You'll notice we don't have any problems right now. And you see this in Eclipse because there's no little red X's hanging around over here. And over here, nothing is in the red. So those little red X's and boxes are ways that Eclipse tells you that you're making mistakes. The next thing we need to do is outline the main program. Now, some people, when they get in a program, get really excited to write code, and so they forget to think about what they're doing first. That turns out to be a big mistake. So what we're going to do is create comments that describe what the main program is going to do. Now, all of our programs are going to have the same structure, at least for a little while. We're going to get some input from the user, do some calculations, and then show the user some output. So that's what our comments will basically say. Here's our first comment. Now, I could just say get input from user, but let's try to be a little bit more specific than that. Get the number of mascara, lipstick, and eye shadows that are purchased. Notice that when I was getting ready to go off the screen that I created a new line. You really do not want to have code that's hanging off the screen because it's hard to debug code that you can't see. So that's the first thing we're going to do. Then we're going to calculate the price of the full purchase. And the last thing we're going to do is show the receipt to the consumer. Now notice none of this code actually runs yet, but it does help us get structure and it helps us break down the problem a little bit. One of the problems with programming is it feels like there's so much that you need to do. And you really do want to start a little bit at a time instead of getting overwhelmed by that. So this is a way of breaking it down. This actually has a name in computer science. It's called subsequent subdivision. I know it's a big word, but it's a way to think about it. The next thing we need to do is to make decisions about our data. We need to select identifiers and types for data. So we know we're going to need to have the number of each of three items ordered. Now all of these items are things that are countable. You could order one mascara or two mascaras or three, but you can't order 2.5 of them. So that tells us what the type should be. It should definitely be an int. And there should be a cost for each item. Now this one turns out to be a little bit trickier. The cost could be a double or could be an int, depending on whether we're storing the cost in pennies or dollars. It doesn't really matter which one you choose, as long as you pay attention to which one you're using and make sure you document it correctly so you know which one you're using. So let's create it in double. That means we'll be storing things in dollars. We also need the name of each item. The names of items are created of characters, and so those should be stored in a string. The tax rate, on the other hand, has a decimal point in it, so that should be a double. And the shipping cost. Now this one's a little bit tricky because our current shipping cost is $8. So it might be tempting to think, oh, that doesn't have a decimal point in it, and so we should make it an int. But if you know anything about online retailers, you know that they're going to be changing their costs. So tomorrow shipping may be $7.99 or $9.99 or $3.99. So you want to make it a double so that the program can be changed if it needs to be later. The other thing we're going to need to keep track of is the total cost. That's money, so that's going to be a double too. So now we have a whole bunch of decisions made about data that we're ready to transfer to the program. So let's write some code. I'm going to do one item first. So let's do our mascara. We decided that the number of mascara needed to be an int. We decided the name of mascara needed to be a string. The price of mascara needed to be a double.
our total price needed to be a double. So let's start our total price at zero because we haven't purchased anything yet. Now, I could put the number of lipsticks and eyeshadows and the names and all those in at this point, but let's wait instead and work with a little bit of code before it gets too overwhelming. We also needed variables for our tax rate. You'll notice that when I'm creating these constants, like 0 0.065, that I always put a zero before the decimal point. That's a habit. It doesn't have to be done that way. The computer will understand it fine without the zero. But it is a way of communicating to other people who are reading the program that this is a double instead of an int. Little things like dots are easy to miss in code. So you're always trying to make the code easier to read. The other thing we needed was our shipping cost. Once again, I could have said just eight, and the program would have worked fine. But because I made it a double, I put 8.00 in it. Now notice I've missed a space there, and I missed another space up above. I'm going to go back and fix those things so that my code really looks nice. OK, so we're going to continue with our strategy to work with one item first, and then we can copy and paste code. The other thing we want to do while we're in our code is to create the input. Now this is going to use a scanner object. Remember, we need to prompt the user because they don't know what we're thinking. So let's go and write that code too. So that code should go right here where it says calculate the price of the full purchase. So we're going to prompt our user, system out print line, how many And then mascara. Remember, mascara is a string variable, so we need to use pluses to tell it to concatenate with how many. Do you wish to purchase? Now the next thing we need to do is to get input. I like to leave my scanner objects up at the top of the class because they get used a lot. So scanner input is new scanner.system.in. Now notice that that's underlined in red right now. The reason that Eclipse isn't happy with that is because it doesn't know where to find the scanner class. The scanner class is not part of java.lang where a lot of other classes are. So we have to give Eclipse instructions. We do that up here by telling Eclipse to import java.util.scanner. And notice Eclipse is happy again. So let's go down now and get the number of mascara from the user. So number mascara equals input dot next int. Now the reason I use next int instead of next double is the number of mascara is an int. Now we could run our program at this point, but we really wouldn't know if we had been successful. So one thing we might want to do is to do just a little bit of output to check. We have more sophisticated ways to debug, and we'll use those later. But for right now, the important thing is to make sure that our input is coming in correctly. I know it looks like I'm being very cautious, and I am, but this actually saves time in programming to be cautious. Now we're ready to run the program. That's this green arrow button up here. How many mascara do you wish to purchase? Let's get one. We saw one as output. Let me raise my console window up so you can see all of that. So the green one was the character I input and the one was the echoing it. We can see that that was done correctly. The other thing that I notice is that I have a question here and I didn't put a question mark on it. That looks a little bit odd, so let's fix that in our code too. Now, one of the things that happened when we did that, you may notice my code is starting to shift back and forth. That's because this line has gotten a little bit too long. So let's break that line into two pieces. 
The next thing we want to do is do some output. Now we did a little bit of output to check that our input was correct, but I'm talking now about the final output from the program. So let's write some code. Now if I was a user, what I would want to see here is not just how much money I owe, but I'd like to see my purchases echoed to make sure that everything is being done correctly. Let's show the receipt to the customer. Now we haven't done most of our calculations. So we're just going to show the number that were ordered. So that will be number, mascara, whoops, and I was about to type in mascara and then I remembered that we have a variable for that. There's going to be something that goes wrong here if we continue on this path. Once we type in number of mascara, remember that's an integer. And mascara is a string that doesn't have a space in front of it. So if we type those in the way they are right now, what we'll see is the number, one, will be right in front of the word mascara. And that won't look pretty. So let's put in an extra space now. The other thing we might like to put in is a period to end the sentence. So that will be after mascara. And there we go. So let's run the program now. Give you a little more counsel so you can see. How many mascara do you wish to purchase? One, you ordered one mascara. Looking good. The next thing we need to do are the calculations. So we can add up the cost of the three items. Now, at this point, we don't have three items in there. So now it's time to, okay, I see I made a mistake here. Do you notice that I put the input statements where it said calculate the price of a full purchase? That's something we need to fix now. That should have been up above there. You'll notice these little things when you're programming. Easy to make lots of mistakes. While we're doing that and copying and pasting that into the right position, let's do it two more times so that we can get our data for our other items. Now this was just debugging output that we put in. We don't need that anymore. Would have been wise to remove that, by the way, before we had copied and pasted it three times. But let's get that out of there. And go back and create our variables. So we'll have an int for number of lipstick. We'll have a string for lipstick, and we'll have a double for the price of lipstick. And I don't remember what lipstick happened to cost, so let's go back up and take a look. Notice this is where it's really nice to have these comments at the top so we can just go back and look and not have to go back to the PowerPoint. So $3.99 is lipstick, and while we're at it, the eyeshadow is $6.99, so we should probably remember that. So the last thing we need is the number of eyeshadow. So we'll have a string for eyeshadow. and a double for the price of eyeshadow. Notice that I've left a space between each group of variables. I do that to make it a little bit easier to read the code. So you don't want to leave too many spaces because then you don't see much code on the screen, but you also don't want to just smash everything together because then it's hard to read. So now let's go down here. So instead of mascara, we'll ask about lipstick next.
and then we'll go down. Notice I've got an extra line there. I'm going to remove that to keep the code looking neat. And we'll look for eyeshadow. Okay, so now we're ready to calculate the price. Total price is going to be the number of mascara times the price of mascara plus, and I think maybe I'll put that on another line because I think we're going to run out of space. Notice that I'm indenting it far enough so that it's still to the right of the equal sign. So we'll have the number of lipstick times the price of lipstick. Don't worry about the fact that Eclipse is going nuts at this point with the red lines. And we'll have the number of eyeshadow times the price of eyeshadow. So that's the total price. Now that we've finished this line, we can see that Eclipse actually has a point. I did make a typo there. And Eclipse is happy once again. Probably it's a good time to run this program. So, let's print out the total price now. Oh, I didn't want to do that. That was all that nice input that we had just put out, so we don't want to get rid of that. Let's just print out system out print line the total cost of your order was plus total price. Now we see that Eclipse has a little red bar there, so we might go and see Ah, once again, Eclipse is right. I forgot something there. I forgot to put a semicolon in. Those things make a big difference in programming. So Eclipse is happy. We can now see this because there are no little red bars over here and no little red X's over here. Don't worry too much about these yellow things. What it's telling us is that we haven't used these variables yet. We actually knew that, so that isn't a problem. Let's run the program. How many mascara? One. How many lipstick? One. How many eyeshadow? One. You ordered one mascara. Now the reason it's not showing all of them is that we didn't print those out and the total cost of your order was $19.87. Okay, so that looks about right. Let's go back and fix our, our output. The other thing that I notice, it's a little odd that we have capital letters in here. So let's go back and fix those two. So let's make the L in lipstick small, the E in eyeshadow small, mascara should be up a little bit. So let's make the M in mascara small and go down and echo our other inputs. So here's the number of mascara. I'm pasting it twice. Whoops, I'm pasting it in the wrong spot, too. We want those to be before the output, not after it. It's a really good idea to cut and paste these lines because that way the formatting is exactly the same. We're going to do number lipstick and lipstick here. And number eyeshadow. And eyeshadow there. And Eclipse is unhappy because I forgot the capital S in eyeshadow. Okay, so why is Eclipse unhappy about number of lipstick? 
Well, if you look up in the formula above, you'll see that the S in stick wasn't capital. So there we go. And once again, we have restored order to Eclipse. So let's run our program. This time, let's buy two mascara, two lipstick, and two eyeshadow. OK, so things are looking good. And we're getting close to having this program finished. So the next thing we need to do is to add the tax. An important thing to consider is what to do about the partial cents, because there's no guarantee that the tax will work out perfectly to a penny. Once we've calculated the price, we know that we're going to have to calculate the tax. Now, the reason I'm creating a variable for this is because users usually want to see how much tax they're paying, particularly on an e-commerce application, since it can be different depending on what state they live in. The tax is going to equal the total price times the tax rate. Now, let's think about that for a minute. First off, let's make sure that our tax rate was done the correct way. So our tax rate is 0 0.065, which is, in fact, 6.5%. And so that should be multiplied by the total price. But at this point, both of these are doubles. And so we have to worry about what to do with possible half cents. Now, when you're doing things like this commercially as a software engineer, you need to be careful. Because very often, states will have specific rules about just exactly how ta tax calculations are supposed to be done. So you really don't want to break those rules. But, you know, it's just a Java course. We're going to be OK. So let's just round up to the nearest penny. To do that, we'll do tax equals tax plus 0 0.005. If you think about that for a minute, you'll think that is just adding half a penny on. At this point, we'll be able to truncate. So we will have our tax equal to tax times 100. That gets it up to pennies. And then we'll make it an int. And that truncates it to an even penny. Now, there are other ways that we can solve this problem. We just don't know the Java yet. We'll get to them later. We certainly now want to tell the user about the tax. So that should probably come between their order and the total cost. So system out print line, your tax was plus tax. The other thing we might want to think about is have we added the tax into the total order or not? If you look up here, you'll see we calculated the tax, but we didn't add it in. So let's add it in now. Total price equals total price plus tax. Now let's run the program. One mascara, one lipstick, one eyeshadow. Our tax was $129. Um, that seems like a lot of tax on a purchase that's 18 bucks. So let's see what went wrong. Well, if you look in the program, you'll notice that we multiplied by 100, but we forgot to divide by 100, too. So the reason we multiply by 100 was to put the price in pennies. Then we could truncate those half cents so we knew we were handling our tax correctly. But then we have to move it back into dollars. So it's a complicated calculation. Let's run it again. One mascara, one lipstick, one eyeshadow. Ah, $1.29. That looks like a little bit more reasonable tax rate. The last thing we need to do is to add in the shipping cost. Once again, that's something that users are going to want to see spelled out on their final receipt. So we need to remember to include it there, too. Now, our shipping was just a flat rate. So our total price equals total price plus shipping. 
One thing I noticed looking at the code now is it would be a good idea to add in a few more comments. I see that I've forgotten the name of our variable shipping too, so we may want to look at that while we're going up. I probably called it something like shipping cost. Yes, I did, and that's a better name. So, let's add in some comments. Like calculate the tax rate, since that's what we were doing. Add the tax to the price. Add the shipping. Now, commercial software engineers actually are supposed to write as many lines of comments as they write of code. In fact, that's a professional standard. We don't usually do that in little programs for class, but you can think of that as being an ideal. So it's very unlikely that you're writing too many comments. OK, so here's our tax. Let's tell the user about the shipping. This time I'll remember that we called it shipping cost. And there we go. So let's run the program one last time. One mascara, one lipstick, one eyeshadow. Tax was $1.29, shipping was eight, and the total cost was $29.16. Now you'll notice that our shipping is shown as 8.0 instead of 8.00. That's a problem that we have with Printline. We'll know how to fix that later, but for right now we don't. It's technically correct, it's just not very pretty. So our program is almost finished now. So we've tested the code, but we only tested it once, and running a program once is really not enough. So the first thing we should do is try testing it by buying zero of each object. This is something called a boundary condition. Things tend to go wrong in computer science at the edges, and so we test the boundaries very carefully. Now before we run the program, we might want to think about what we're expecting to see from this. You have to be a little careful here. In our program right now, what we're going to see is that if we buy zero of everything, we get $8 of shipping. That's kind of unfortunate, but it just has to do with the fact that we don't know how to avoid that yet. Still, let's see it in the code. So we're going to run again. Zero mascara, zero lipstick, zero eyeshadow, and we end up paying eight bucks. That's probably not going to make customers very happy. But then again, we're not quite ready to write commercial software just yet. We tried the case where we bought one of each object, but let's try just buying one of each object one at a time. That's a good boundary case too. So let's buy one mascara, no lipstick, no eyeshadow. 17.57. That mascara got expensive. That's what eight bucks of shipping will do for you. Now let's buy no mascara. One lipstick, no eyeshadow. Twelve twenty-five. Remember, lipstick was a lot less expensive. And now, no mascara, no lipstick, one eyeshadow. Fifteen thirty-four. So things are looking good. Now you would certainly want to take your calculator and make sure that those numbers are correct. But I checked them; they're fine. Maybe we could buy one, two, and three of the objects too, because we really haven't tested whether numbers greater than one are working correctly. So one mascara, two lipstick, three eyeshadow. 48 bucks, pretty hefty purchase, but then again, it's a lot of makeup. Now, here's an interesting question. How can we test whether the tax is rounding properly? Because our numbers have been odd here, it's a little hard to tell. But we did something really smart. We made our numbers variables. So let's change one of them to an even number where we can really easily tell if the tax is being worked with correctly. Like, for example, $10. So we'll go back to our code, and let's change the price of mascara. 
way back up at the top. to ten dollars. Now at this point we know exactly how many cents we should get. We should have 65 cents of tax added in. So let's run our program. Just buy one mascara, no lipstick, no eyeshadow, and we get 1865. So that was ten dollars for the mascara, 65 cents for the tax, and eight dollars for the shipping. So that works too. Oh yes, before we go back, one of the things you want to make sure you do when you do that kind of testing is that you restore your program to its original state. That's easy to forget and that actually leaves you with an incorrect program. Here's my advice on implementing programs in general. First off, get started early. A lot of people get into programming trouble because they start the night before something is due. And then if something goes wrong, they can't get help. There are a lot of things that can go wrong in programming. And it helps if you have the time to get some support. Notice that I write just a little bit of code at a time. I don't write hundreds of lines and then try to fix it. I also keep the code neat and organized at all times. Indentation is especially important, particularly as we go on. And I use meaningful variable names. That way I know what things mean in the program. And I test as soon as possible, and I test as often as possible. Do those things, you should have a lot of success programming too.